So uh, basically, I want to discuss allergies in horses, and they're definitely more um, diseases that are based on allergy responses than just itchy skin, but I've tried to include the big ones, which would include insect hypersensitivity and other causes of itchy skin and tails. Uh, and then I'll, I'll end up discussing um, airway allergies or, or equine asthma, as we now um, know the disease is called. So as a basic outline of this discussion, then we'll talk about heat, heat hives, excuse me, and wheel, wheels or urticaria are essentially the same, uh, different names for the same thing. Um, so we've all probably experienced hives after a bee sting. Um, and I've got some images of what they look like in horses. Then I'll talk about primarily fly bite dermatitis and how we try to control it. Uh, and then a few different causes of uh, itchy tails or rubbing, rubbing of tails and, and mane. Uh, and then I'll end up discussing equine asthma and a, a newer product that we actually use to treat equine asthma that's just come on the market um, that I'll briefly discuss as well. So hives or urticaria or wheels, those are all synonymous terms. They all mean the same thing. It's a very common uh, scenario in horses to develop welts and, and hives, just like in people. It is based on science of basically certain cell types that um, degranulate or explode their contents and release them into the skin. It, it causes uh, inflammation and edema and fluid formation, and that's what causes the welt. And in people, obviously, it causes a redness, but you don't usually appreciate that in a pigmented horse, but it definitely causes the same type wheel reaction. There are a large number of potential causes, and honestly, we rarely, uh, unless you see your horse, you, you know, bit by a a bee stung by a bee or an insect or whatnot, we often don't determine the underlying cause. Uh, it can be skin reactions. Wheels can even be caused by airborne, airborne allergens and even food allergies, drug administration, vaccine uh, reactions. Someone mentioned in the previous um, question and answer session about their horse developing reactions to vaccines. So that's fairly common. Again, feed, they can be allergic to different feed supplements, uh, different types of hays and grains, exposure to plants in the pasture, insect bite uh, reactions are probably the most common cause of wheels, but oftentimes we don't determine what is causing the horse's uh, wheels to, to erupt and they can be recurrent. Um, they can, and a horse have essentially any different pattern you can imagine. They're often multifocal or present in multiple different sites and the and the wheels or the enlarged round areas are often very different shapes and in, in a lot of different places. As they worsen, they can coalesce and, and kind of merge together and, and cause very large plaques. Um, as horses develop really severe uh, allergic reactions, they can also involve their respiratory tract and, and can compromise their um, respiratory tract and cause dyspnea and, and um, difficulty in breathing. So they can be life-threatening if it's an anaphylactic type reaction, but often they are not. Um, but even in horses, um, individuals can often develop really bizarre shaped um, patterns to their wheels and whatnot on their skin. This is just a few images here. This is actually one of our residents uh, horse that would get wheels really commonly. So you can see one here. Can you see my pointer, Dr. Honey? So here's a wheel, here's one back towards the triceps elbow region. This horse is also very stocked up. So um, those are all the result of um, an allergic reaction and essentially degranulation of those inflammatory cells in their skin and causes a local inflammation in the blood vessel system leaks out um, fluid and protein and causes the leg to swell or wherever the lesions are. So these are classic astoldies from the internet, but you can see the raised edge here. Um, this is a very classic wheel or urticarial uh, reaction on a horse. This is a person, obviously, we probably all experienced that. So red raised nodules that are often itchy or pruritic is the medical term that we use. So horses also often develop itchy skin associated with the wheels, but most often these are not uh, a serious medical uh, situation, but in a show horse, uh, certainly it's something we, we have to control sometimes in a, in a show scenario, um, but often it's difficult for us to reach a diagnosis and we may 
you know, have a certain history in that horse, that they have very recurrent episodes uh, of, of outbreaks, essentially, of urticaria. It may be seasonal, may be associated with a change in feed, a change in bedding material, you know, change in shampoo. There's a lot of different potential causes. Typically, we try to treat them initially uh, fairly conservatively with a hypoallergenic type shampoo, so something that's fairly non-reactive. Probably the most widely available non-reactive shampoo that you could get in a horse would be straight ivory dish soap or the old green um, type palm olive. Those are good hypoallergenic um, shampoos that are less expensive than the commercial ones made for horses. But um, essentially first days the horse and try to, you know, if, if you have introduced something different in their environment, remove that. Um, but then if that doesn't work, usually you're going to involve your veterinarian um, to potentially administer a steroid shot. Um, some horses, the dose of steroids that we need is uh, to control within some horses is quite low. So I try to start conservative with that approach as well and use a lower, a lower dose of dexamethasone because uh, many drugs can have side effects and steroids certainly can in the horse. Um, when we, when we think about steroid reactions in the horse, we usually think about laminitis and I definitely, um, don't want to cause that disease when I'm treating something that's probably not life-threatening like a urticarial wheel. Um, so trying to, if you have a horse that, that develops this problem recurrently over and over, it can be a management frustration for sure. And in those situations, you probably want to try systematic re removal of different objects you know, from that horse's environment, starting with topical things like bedding uh, and shampoos and fly sprays and change those up uh, one at a time and try to determine what they're allergic to. But that can be uh, a challenge for sure. So moving on then, the probably the most frustrating hyper, uh, allergic skin disease that we deal with in horses is a hypersensitivity reaction to insect bites. And, and in this part of the country, uh, it is common. It's also common in Europe, and depending on where you are raised, uh, in the horseman terms change <laughs> based on our location. So in Europe, they often use the terms like sweet itch or Queensland itch or muck itch. We tend to use um, fly bite sensitivity or, or um, allergic you know, type, type terms. We don't tend to use these, but that's common in, in Europe. Uh, most, the most common uh, fly that, that's been associated with hypersensitivity reactions is the culicoides, which in the south, I'm from Georgia, we call those no because they're so tiny you can barely see them. And when they bite you, they feel like they have teeth the size of a, a shark. Um, so the, the way that this causes allergy is, is horses develop allergic uh, reactions to the sa saliva, basically the proteins in the, in the insect's saliva that are deposited in the skin when they bite. Um, this is mainly for veterinarians and, and vet students, but there are different types of allergic uh, reactions as far as pathways in our immune system. And this, this insect hypersensitivity causes both um, IgE, which is a type of immunoglobulin to be formed, and then also cells that are present in the horse's skin uh, react to these um, salivary antigens as well. So proteins in the saliva of the horse's um, spit that's deposited in, in the skin when, when they bite. These are just images of different types of flies that can cause uh, insect hypersensitivity. And again, the, the asterisk is by the big one that, that causes the worst um, reactions as far as insect hypersensitivity. And again, culicoides is a scientific name around here. We, we call them sand gnats or noceums. Um, they're very small gnat. Um, this is a big picture, but they're very small in that that have, that have a, a very potent salivary antigen and painful bite. Uh, but black flies, stable flies, horn flies, and especially deer flies uh, in this part of the country can also cause uh, insect hypersensitivity. There are definitely certain breeds that are predisposed uh, to developing, especially culicoides uh, hypersensitivity, and most of them are ponies, but Welsh ponies, Icelandics, Connemaras. Uh, but even some larger breeds like German Shires and, and Arabians are also predisposed. We don't tend to have too many of these breeds around here, and we still see uh, a lot of horses develop insect hypersensitivity. But there's definitely a genetic component like almost any disease that we deal with in, in human medicine or equine medicine. 
So again, pruritic means itchy. So insect hypersensitivity is the most common itchy skin disorder in the horse. Um, this image on the right is the underbelly of a horse. Um, and you can see some flies here, but this is straight on midline. So this is the horse's belly button right here. And then you can see there's hair loss right here in this wide band and it's swollen from here to here. So all of this is thickened, leathery skin uh, with hair loss and changes in the pigmentation associated with um, insect bite hypersensitivity or allergy to insect um, salivary um, proteins. And it's, lichenification is a long scientific fancy word for thick and leathery skin. And that's what this image is here, right here on the horse's belly. Um, so we tend to see it dis distribute in different areas. So uh, in horses that develop hair loss and itchiness across their top line, uh, along their mane, their tail, those are most commonly associated with certain types of flies. And chelicoides, that's a common area as well as black flies. And then other horses are, are, are affected ventrally. And, and somewhat depends on what fly they're allergic to. Uh, and some horses can have problems in both areas. Uh, and when they're on the dorsal midline or on the top line involving the mane and tail, those horses can have uh, extreme hair loss and, and problems from, you know, so much uh, aggressive itching along their, their mane and tail. I've got some pictures later. Um, but they tend to be seasonal, obviously, with, with insect hypersensitivities are going to be more common. They're going to pick up in the early spring when the flies come out and then usually extend through the fall. Most often horses that have these conditions worse and yearly, every year it gets worse and worse and worse if there's not appropriate control uh, of, the, of the exposure of the, the fly and insect exposure on the horse. They can also develop uh, wheels associated with these reactions. And then a lot of times there's secondary infections uh, associated with, you know, matted hair where they've chewed and, and you know, rubbing and, and all the excoriation and trauma that they do to the skin, there's also a lot of common secondary bacterial infections that develop. But you can see this horse has a really ratty mane and um, I can use the big scientific word like unification, but you can see this is really leathery and a lot of um, folds here. So that skin would be very, very thick uh, and, and a lot of hair loss and the, and the hairs are all broken off, especially even back here to the, to the tail as well, the tail end. So this is a horse I had in here several years ago. Again, he, he doesn't have a roached mane, but he is about uh, rubbed all of his mane out uh, and his tail is, is really severely affected as well. I think you can appreciate not only the hair loss, but the, the skin is very thickened and leathery, uh, which is classic for insect hypersensitivity. So diagnosis, as far as tools your veterinarian may use to try to determine exactly what's causing uh, the you know, the insect hypersensitivity essentially will take an a in-depth history and do a full physical exam and try to rule out other diseases that can mimic insect hypersensitivity. We may do skin scrapings to rule out parasites that are fairly uncommon, but I, I've actually got a patient in the hospital right now that has, has some mites. Um, it's more common in, in the winter uh, in, in horses that are ill-thrifty, and I have a patient that's, that's pretty sick and um, has a lot of weight loss, but he has uh, um, some mange mites um, that were visible. We didn't have to do skin scrapings uh, to see them, but when they're small, um, then we'll take a, a skin scraping if they're not obvious and, and put it on a slide and look under the microscope to identify them. Uh, and then sometimes to rule out um, ringworm and whatnot and, and bacterial infections, not only fungal, but bacterial infections will do cultures, uh, both for fung fungal elements as well as bacterial uh, pathogens. And then food trials, those are tough to do, but when you've ruled out the easy things and, and you've ruled out insect hypersensitivity and the horse is still having really itchy skin and, and or recurrent wheels that are itchy and bothersome uh, because of their continued recurrence, um, then we'll often use food trials in those horses and try to determine what they're sensitive to. That, that is quite difficult um, to determine sometimes, but um, that's how we have to back into that diagnosis. So managing insect hypersensitivity really is fly control. Uh, and we, we all think about, you know, fly sprays and whatnot, and then, and then uh, different types of fly sheets and barrier uh, things we can use to prevent the flies from biting. But a big thing that we often don't think about is pulling those horses 
off pasture and putting them in a stall during the peak times of that insect's activity. And usually with, with um, chelicoides or sand gnats or noceums as we, as we call them in Georgia, those tend to be most active uh, at dusk and right at dawn. So if you pull those horses into a stall and put a really strong fan, it has to be a strong fan, strong enough to keep a small insect like that from lighting on the horse. If you have small, uh, you know, small enough stall and a, and a large enough uh, velocity fan, you can actually prevent them from lighting on the, on the horse. So you pull them in at the right time of the day uh, before dusk starts to uh, come on, and then you put these fans on and hopefully prevent them from biting your horse. Um, it also worked with mosquitoes. You know, mosquito in, insect hypersensitivity is not that common, but culicoides that definitely works for. And then man removing manure uh, is certainly important. We all, all we all of us pick stalls, but we don't often think about how far away that manure is dumped from the from the stable or the barn. Um, so making sure it's far enough away that the flies don't get back to the, where the horses are stabled is important. Uh, and then insecticides, certainly we use them and some are better than others. Um, so that's really the mainstay as far as fly control when the horses are out. And then there are other biologic ways to try to control fly populations on your farm. And you're probably familiar with the, the wasps that are um, actually predators to the fly, um, to some of the stable flies. So these, I've used these in, in our place, um, not enough recurrently year after year to get a really high population, but the years that I have used them, I've found it to be effective um, at reducing the general fly population. So other things that are that are really handy and some horses that have severe uh, insect hypersensitivity have to wear uh, basically a complete shield and, and they make some of these even for their legs that are more uh, net based uh, application with Velcro for the legs. But so fly masks, face masks, total, full, full uh, body fly sheets, as far as a barrier, those are quite useful. And, and if your horse tolerates them um, and doesn't tear, your, uh, tear them up and, and lead to a great expense year after year, these, these can be effective as well. So treatment, um, it, despite all those management con, um, control uh, approaches, we still often have to treat horses with severe insect hypersensitivity with medications. Again, I try to avoid them because uh, steroids especially can have harmful side effects. And, you know, developing laminitis in a horse that just has a fly bite hypersensitivity is a serious complication. So I try to minimize doses of steroids and minimize their use. But horses that are severely affected often have to have steroids um, to control the, the disease. Antihistamines work really well in people for allergies, but they don't work near as well in horses. And I would say if you have a horse with this uh, or other allergic diseases that starting antihistamines well before the seasonal uh, occurrence of or development of the problem in your horse is it's more likely to be effective, but in my hands, they're much less effective than steroids. Uh, another approach that can be used both for uh, allergic skin disease as well as allergic airway disease is replacing a significant amount of their diet with uh, omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. And just like in people, if you take fish oil or eat a lot of fish like I do to try to stay healthy, those omega-3 fatty acids from fish, the fat in the fish, as well as these supplements, essentially those fatty acids incorporate into our body, into our cell membranes of our multiple cells throughout our body. So they're helpful for people with cardiovascular risk factors uh, as far as hypertension and, and um coronary artery disease and, and high, high cholesterol, those help with that in, uh, inflammatory process. And they also help uh, with an inflammatory diseases like insect hypersensitivity and, and asthma. It does take a long time. So it takes a period of months for a feed change like that to lead to incorporation of those fatty acids in the horse's you know, membranes in the cells in their body. But there are definitely some studies that support this approach for the control of insect hypersensitivity as well as uh, allergic airway disease that we'll talk about next. Often we use these combinations um, because a lot of these horses are, are so severe, it's difficult to control. Um, so glucocorticoids again, then steroids are kind of the mainstay as far as a veterinary approach to treatment. 
but at home, certainly omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid supplementation. There's, there's a lot of different products out there. I'm not um, advocating or, or, or I'm not paid by any of these companies, but I just put some examples up here and, and you can, you know, try to find the best bang for your buck out there if you're good at math. And, um, you know, look at the different products and, and compare concentrations in those products, then you can probably find one that's affordable. If you have a horse with these uh, conditions, it, it's probably worth it. But it does take months usually for clinical signs to um, abate after starting these products because it takes so long for those fatty acids to be incorporated into the horse's um, membranes in their, in their body, their cell membranes. So we'll move now to tail rubbing. This can definitely occur with uh, insect hypersensitivity, but some of the big ones would be um, oxyurus equi or whipworms. Uh, we see some resistance in that parasite. It used to be that parasite was essentially confined to younger aged horses. And I, I didn't see horses that are older rubbing their tail, but I've actually owned some horses that have been affected by this parasite on fairly good deworming programs. Uh, and way older than they should still be having um, this parasite. So if you have a horse that is rubbing their tail, uh, especially if they're only rubbing their tail, they don't have evidence of insect hypersensitivity or rubbing or itching anywhere else, then ruling out this parasite is important. We do a tape test to determine um, the presence of eggs around the anus. So the female essentially emerges from the anus and deposits eggs along the um, skin there, the anal region and, it, and the egg component and the adherent um, product that they, they deposit to stick these eggs there uh, essentially is very itchy to the horse. And so they start rubbing at their tail um, because, that, because of perianal um, itching and they rub their tail hairs out. Ticks, this is another really common place for ticks to get in the um, base of the mane they'll get and the armpit or the axillary region and then at the base of the tail. Um, in this part of the country, this, this particular tick is quite common, um, but we see a lot of other ticks that, that like to reside there as well. So looking for those, especially the small ones, can be a challenge. Um, they tend to cause a, a raised area where there's a tick, uh, and when you pull them out, they usually have a, um, a little nodule there with maybe a, a little bit of pus that can be expressed out. But those, those are a visual diagnosis. Oxyurus equi would take a tape test unless you see the adult um, that sometimes is seen in the manure. And then mange can also uh, affect um, the tail as well as fly blade hypersensitivity that I already talked about. So this image I stole off the internet. So this, this horse, you can see this blurred uh, image here is a bunch of tail hairs that are all um, rubbed and, and um, broken off. But you can see this female uh, at, at the edge of this horse's anus. So she's deposited a bunch of eggs here and that's what's causing the itchiness uh, and the rubbing of the tail. So we do a tape test and put it on the slide or, or scrape the area gently and put it on a slide and you can see these eggs to document it. Um, often we will honestly just deworm the horse with an appropriate uh, dewormer and, and then wash the area because those eggs that are deposited there are still gonna itch even if you kill that parasite with the appropriate dewormer. Um, usually it's younger horses, but again, I've seen this in older horses as well. Um, and, and some of my horses that, that developed it were primarily on ivermectin. Uh, and so there is some potential resistance out there to ivermectin. Some of the better um, anthelmintics are actually oxybendazole um, that, that's been shown from studies a little more effective uh, against this parasite. Don't forget to wash their rump area and try to remove those um, eggs. And then you can also use anti-itch sprays that are out there commercially that have usually a little bit of steroid in it to try to provide some itch relief. And now um, I'll take questions at the end, I guess, but now I'll move on to another um, allergic disease in horses. It's quite common, especially in this part of the country. And uh, it's, it's allergic airway disease, or now we call it equine asthma. And, and it has had many different names in the past. Um, broken wind was one of the original terms way back in the literature uh, in the 1800s. This, this disease has been recognized for a really long time and, and looking in some of the old medical texts, you'll find the term broken wind. Uh, heaves is probably the most common horseman type term that we use to describe equine asthma. 
these other terms are now out of favor uh, and the, and the um, most favorable terminology that we use now is equine asthma because it is very similar to human asthma. Um, there is one cause of equine asthma that is primarily associated with the summer uh, pasture exposure to pollens most likely. And so we still use this term uh, because it's a quite different um, seasonal um, presentation for equine asthma, but I'll talk briefly about, about all the different types. So there basically are mild forms of asthma, just like in people, and then more severe forms of asthma in horses. Tends to be that the more severe forms are going to be diagnosed in horses that are older. So horses are typically older than seven or eight and, and even up into the teenage years. As we diagnose severe asthma, most of those cases are not um, basically reversible, okay? So the, the disease process advances to a stage where um, they develop recurrent uh, obstruction of their small airways, and I'll talk through how that happens here in a minute. But basically, once your horse has severe asthma, it's gonna be a, a disease that has to be controlled. There's not really a cure. But we do see some younger horses that develop a milder form of asthma in some of these, it, it is reversible and doesn't come back. So as far as risk factors, we definitely know there uh, is a genetic component. Uh, and, and this is, we're learning more and more about this in, in more recent uh, research. There has been some, there have been some studies in Europe to suggest that bacteria and viral um, pathogens can be involved in, in a, as a risk factor for equine asthma. But by and far, the biggest one is dust. Dust and molds in hay uh, are by and far the most important uh, cause of equine asthma in horses. So controlling that is a key uh, component of, of treatment really in managing it. So what do we know about managing their environment? We know that um, if you allow them to eat from a hay net, that's a bad thing. We know that if you uh, supply hay in the form of a round bale, that's a bad thing. Um, but we know uh, horses that are fed hay, it is primarily molds and fungal elements in their hay that drives this, this um, disease. On the pasture scenario, it's probably pollens. Uh, and there are diff different types of grasses that may uh, also be more uh, allergenic to certain individual horses. Other things that are present in the hay beyond mold and fungal elements and pollen elements uh, are endotoxin elements. And these are basically components of bacteria that are present in the hay and in the horse's environment. Uh, and when we feed them in different ways, we can reduce the exposure to, to those hay molds, fungal elements, and, and endotoxin. So what is you know, what causes the disease? Pathophysiology is a fancy term for what causes this condition uh, and, and how is it affecting the horse's ability to breathe. So we know that these pollens uh, and these fungal elements uh, essentially gain access to the lower airway into the lung and they cause the small airways to constrict. If any of you have ever had an asthmatic attack, um, I experienced one last spring and it is pretty scary. Uh, I never had it before in my life, but when, when you develop bronchoconstriction and your small airways uh, constrict down, it is quite difficult to breathe. Um, so these allergens promote inflammation, uh, which calls different types of cells into the airway and promotes further inflammation and mucus buildup. But a big component of the clinical signs is actually bronchoconstriction associated with that allergic reaction and that, that airway closing down. It can result in horses basic and same thing in people. If they get significant bronchoconstriction and inflammation and, and buildup of mucus, they essentially can't, um, their lungs can't do the job that they're made to do, right? The lungs are important to oxygenate our blood to supply our tissues. And when it's extreme uh, bronchoconstriction and or inflammation, they can't um, oxygenate their blood uh, to a capacity to, to keep their arterial oxygen in a normal um, you know, 95 to 100 millimeters per mercury. And when it drops below that, they can develop signs of, of respiratory distress and exercise intolerance. So the clinical signs that you'll most often note at home uh, if your horse develops asthma 
early cough, uh, early during work, uh, a cough associated with eating hay uh, or an intermittent chronic cough. They don't often have a nasal discharge, but they may have a mild nasal discharge. Uh, as the disease progresses, usually they start coughing early with exercise and then it goes away and you keep working the horse and they're doing fine. As the disease progresses, then they often develop signs of exercise intolerance. If it worsens and they have airway remodeling and a lot of uh, scar tissue formation, then they can definitely develop dyspnea or difficult breathing where they can have weight loss. And essentially they're using so much energy to breathe at that point. Uh, a lot of times the, the disease is terminal based on a quality of life issue. Seasonality, typically those horses associated with the summer pasture form. So summer pasture associated obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma is a whole lot easier term, but the seasonality of that form, usually those horses are at pasture and it's an early spring onset and continues until the frost. With horses that are in a stall, um, especially in parts of the, the country that are colder and you bring horses in in the winter, a lot of times that, that is the seasonal association with the um, type of uh, asthma associated with hay molds. So clinical signs can be variable. Um, the first thing we see uh, as a veterinarian is a change in the respiratory character. The first thing you're going to see is potentially a cough uh, early during work or maybe when in a dusty area or when fed fed hay. Um, if this works, I'm going to share a video of a horse with uh, some of the early clinical signs of, of severe, of severe, it's not going to work, of severe asthma. So here, this horse has a flared nostril. So I think you can appreciate the respiratory rate is higher than it should be. And this horse is kind of gasping for a breath and their, their muscles here, basically it has a flared um, nares uh, that's constantly flared because they're, they're trying to breathe harder. The big thing that we'll note here is this heave line here. And if you pay attention to the respiratory, if you pay attention to this respiratory phase, so when they're breathing in versus when they're breathing out, this disease causes bronchoconstriction which makes it more difficult for them to breathe out or expel air or on expiration. There's a marked abdominal. So, uh, uh, so a lot more dramatic abdominal push when they're breathing out. And that's classic for, for a horse with heaves. And they were outlining the heave line there. So as this goes on in time, over time, this horse will develop um, the muscles right there because they're using them so um, constantly to, to breathe out, those muscles actually hypertrophy and they'll get a, a heave line that stays there. So, and this horse has a heave line and a flared nostril as well. So this is severe asthma, it wouldn't be reversible and it would have to be managed uh, on a yearly basis. When we listen to them as a veterinarian, we'll often hear Wheezing during that expiration phase, if they're severe enough, you can hear this without a stethoscope standing beside your horse listening to their, to their, um, you know, from here, you can, you could be holding them on this lead shank and still hear it. Um, but the heave line is pretty classic once it develops as well. So as veterinarians, we use uh, garbage bags a lot to do a, a rebreathing exam when the clinical signs are subtle, then we can listen to them with a stethoscope and, and try to appreciate abnormal airway sounds. And again, with this disease, wheezes on expiration are classic. We also use an endoscope sometimes to look into their airway and look for evidence of mucus. And then we'll do a, a, a test called a bronchoalveolar lavage. We basically take a tube uh, or an endoscope and run down the horse's nasal cavity up into their back of their throat, come down their trachea and lodge it at the base of their lungs and wash out an area of their lungs um, to look at the cells population in that um, airway sample, uh, which can help us guide their treatment, make a diagnosis and guide the appropriate treatment. So this is a, again, a, a scientific researchy slide for veterinarians primarily, but I wanted to show you the different grades of mucus um, that we can see with endoscopy. So with the inflammation, again, there's an influx of cells, which are represented here, 
And then this squiggly purple line is stained mucus. And you can see on endoscopy, this is a clean airway. So here's the horse's um, neck would be here. So we're looking down into their airway, but so their neck would be here. So this is up and this is down. So gravity, here's a little bit of mucus, a little bit more, a little bit more, a whole lot more. And stage five or grade five is, that's a just a long stream of mucus in that horse's airway, usually from, from about here at their chest all the way halfway up their trachea sometimes. So we grade that and we can use an endoscope not only to visually appreciate that, but also to, to sample part of that mucus pool and do cytology. Um, a better way is actually to wedge a tube down into their airway that I've talked about and actually get a sample and, and that's called bronchoalveolar lavage. So this tube that we use um, commonly has a little bulb on the end of it. And so we run this way down into the horse's airway, wedge it into a small airway, blow that tube up and then rinse out their airway with usually about 240 mils, which is quite a large volume. That's about, um, I'm trying to think in, in um, it would be about a, a, uh, a pint probably. Um, so it's a lot of fluid, but the horses absorb what we don't pull back and it helps us um, get a fluid sample out and again, make a diagnosis and guide treatment. We can use the endoscope or, or a blinded um, just tube passing it through their nose like we would a nasogastric tube, except we go into the airway, not into the esophagus. We require heavy sedation and horses don't really like that experience. They cough a lot. Um, so we can also often um, put some lidocaine in there and prevent them from coughing, but we, we also sedate them heavily. This slide just shows the different types of cells that can be uh, responsible for the inflammation. So we see different syndromes. Some of them are primarily driven by neutrophil or neutrophilic inflammation. Again, just a different type of white, white blood cell. Mast cells, the one here with all the pretty pigments in the cytoplasm. Uh, and then eosinophils are these big pigments in the cytoplasm. So these three different types of cells are the primary drivers of inflammation. And depending on what type we determine, may indicate what type of treatment we would provide that horse. So as far as treatment, again, removing the trigger, controlling exposure to dust is super important, and then controlling the inflammation is the second phase of treatment, and controlling bronchospasm. So we have different drugs to control inflammation and to control bronchospasm, and the trigger factor is totally environmental. And if you don't do this and only do this, you're not gonna control the disease period. Um, so there's some studies that I'll, that I'll try to show you here that will also um, support why we make these recommendations. So reducing exposure to dust and moles is, is paramount. Uh, you know, storage of hay above the stalls is really handy to drop it down over the stalls. I, I'm uh, guilty of this, but it's not smart, okay, because all this dust ends up in the, in the um, you know, breathing air space of your horse. So avoid storage of hay up here, uh, avoid straw bedding, try to use good quality um, shavings, uh, keep your owls areas and your riding areas moistened down uh, with water so they're, they're not dusty when you're riding out in the arena. Remove your horses from your stalls. If you're gonna use this, that's a real no-no, but definitely don't do that when your horses are stalled. So no leaf blowers to try to clean the aisle ways and don't store hay overhead. This is a study essentially that supports environmental control alone um, can be effective. It just takes a really long time. So in this graph, we have airway resistance, which is just a marker of how much bronchoconstriction they have from the inflammation. Um, so, you know, going down would be better. Uh, so after six months of just environmental control, which is the open circles, you can see that after six months, you get about the same amount of control of the disease as you do with uh, inhaled steroids. The big point though, is that with inhaled steroids, um, we get a response, pretty quick response, usually within weeks. The first sample time here was a month, but significant improvement in uh, resistance, airway resistance with both environmental control and steroid um, administration. So again, um, big no-nos are round bales. Don't feed from a hay net, feed from uh, feed from the ground. We've shown from studies that the respirable um, 
fungal elements and endotoxin goes down when you feed from the ground. And then when horses are really severely affected, we sometimes have to take them off hay and use a complete pelleted uh, ration. So here's some graphs again, just to show you uh, the difference in respirable products that can cause this disease. Uh, when you compare soaked hay to steamed hay to haylage, we don't use haylage in this country, but in Europe, they occasionally use haylage. And, and there are definitely some products on the market now uh, for steaming bales of hay that are quite useful. Uh, but the big thing is to feed on the ground and to avoid round bales. But you can see here in this graph, feeding uh, hay from a net versus hay on the ground, and especially in this column here, which is endotoxin. Again, bacterial products that are present in the hay, um, they go way down when horses are, are fed from the ground. Uh, same thing as far as comparison. So straight hay that's not wet, steamed hay, and then haylage, you can see the respirable products. So those things that are five microns or less can make it all the way down into the lower airway. Uh, and they go way down when that hay is um, processed by haylage and even just steamed. So you can wet your hay uh, and achieve this same thing. You don't want to soak it very long, but you can dunk your hay, uh, you know, in a, in a clean muck bucket or big five gallon bucket if it's a small enough hay sample just dunk it down to get the dust off of it would essentially do the same thing. As far as um, supplements, I mentioned before, we talked about um, allergic skin disease, same thing with allergic airway disease, chronic supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids uh, reduces the airway inflammation. This graph is a little bit um, counterintuitive, but this cough score here going up is good, okay? So that means more comfort, less coughing. And uh, the closed squares are the diet treatment. So after, really after the first week, they saw a difference, but especially out, out at week six, there's a very significant improvement in the cough score. So reduction in cough associated with um, supplementation of this fatty acid that promotes uh, an anti-inflammatory um, cell membrane uh, health basically. Uh, and so the cough score improved by 60% versus placebo was 33. Respiratory effort uh, improved or respiratory effort decreased by 48% versus 27% in placebo. And then when they sampled these horses by bronchoalveolar lavage to determine what cells are present, the inflammation essentially went down. Okay, so before treatment, 23% and 9% um, evidence of inflammatory cells uh, after this uh, treatment uh, with the omega-3 fatty acids. So those supplements, again, are expensive, but quite useful if they're given long enough. Other medical things that we do as veterinarians, uh, systemic steroids, especially dexamethasone, prednisolone, and then the human medications to control asthma uh, can also be used in horses. Uh, and this is a, a, a smorgasbord of them. So anything from albuterol to promote a bronchodilation to different types of steroids to control inflammation. And then in horses, we also have an oral uh, option for bronchodilator uh, in the name of the commercial product is clenbuterol. You're probably familiar with it. So clenbuterol is made by Boringer as well. Um, it has some side effects. I certainly wouldn't advocate long-term treatment with uh, clenbuterol um, because the horses can have some adverse heart effects as well as adverse performance effects. So I don't like to use it for more than a couple of weeks in a row. Uh, and, and I prefer to use it intermittently and combine it with steroids because the steroids can offset some of the downregulation of the receptors and, and allow the, the clenbuterol to work better uh, over time. But long-term use is, is a no-no um, because of the adverse effects of this drug. Other um, pretty innovative ways to get uh, aerosolized medications in horses. There's quite a bit of options out there. Uh, this would be an option for a meter-dosed inhaler. That's a human medication device that devel delivers uh, a spray into this chamber and then is taken in when you time it the right way. The horse um, breathes it in and takes it down to their lower airways. This is a nebulizer, uh, which actually creates a mist. Uh, you put the drug into this little uh, reservoir here, and then it creates a mist and this seals on the horse's muzzle and they can breathe uh, longer uh, with 
different types of drugs. We even use this to, to administer antibiotics to sick horses um, here in the hospital. And this device is one of the first devices used to, to administer medications to the horse um, through the Nares. And this was actually a Boringer product that's no longer available. It was one of the earliest ones that was utilized. Um, this is an older device as well here that you can use a meter dose inhaler with. Um, this device is still on the market as well to use a meter dose inhaler with. Uh, depending on the product, some of these are more expensive than others. Um, but I'll show you really the reason that we have pushed towards more airway medications um, in contrast to administering the horse a shot of, of steroids is that shots of steroids, whether they're given to people or horses, are somewhat product dependent, but anytime you give a steroid in the muscle or intravenously or orally, you're going to suppress um, that horse's adrenal gland function. And horses are very predisposed to laminitis when we use steroids and, and uh, it has something to do with adrenal gland suppression. And when we deliver steroids by um, straight inhalation down into the airway, the amount of adrenal suppression is much less, depending on the product, uh, is much less compared to uh, administering dexamethasone systemically, either by IV, um, intramuscular, or oral administration. Both of them work quite well. Uh, and these graphs, again, on, on the y-axis is airway reactivity. Um, so higher reactivity is um, bad and reduced reactivity is good. Um, so with dexamethasone treatment, before the horses were here and then after dexamethasone, their reactivity went down. So that was effective to treat asthma. As well, flutic fluticasone is a fairly expensive inhaled human uh, steroid um, but it also works quite well in horses. Um, so we would prefer to use inhaled steroids to treat this disease uh, to avoid laminitis risk and, and adrenal suppression. So now brand new uh, on the market uh, as of this past um, spring, um, or this spring actually, um, attempted to come on the market during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, exactly a year ago, but uh, that set us back a little bit. And this is now on the market uh, for use in horses you can appreciate that it's a similar design to that earlier uh, Boringer product that had, had a um, different gun delivery device. But this delivery device uh, has both a mist uh, type uh, mechanism in the handle and then this ergonomic um, apparatus here fits in the horse's nostril. So, and, and most horses tolerate it, some don't, but with training, I think most horses tolerate it. Uh, and then it's administered, seals off the nostril basically, and then you time the delivery with when the horse breathes in and, and then pull the plunger and it delivers the product. This is a really exciting opportunity in, in equine medicine for, for us as veterinarians and for you as, as horse owners. This drug is much more potent than uh, dexamethasone. And it's also very safe based on the fact that it's a pro drug. So it has to be taken into the airway um, lining or the epithelial lining of the airway. The drug has to be absorbed through that lining and then enzymes have to break it down and change it into the active drug. And that's what, why it's called a pro-drug. So the drug is delivered by aerosol, makes its way to the, to the lower airways, is absorbed across the airway and then enzymes activate it, esterase enzymes activate it, and then it becomes a much more potent steroid um, to reduce inflammation and act as an anti-inflammatory agent uh, in the lower, lower airway of the horse. So it's about uh, 12 times more potent than dexamethasone and it has none of the side effects of, of adrenal suppression. So steroids, of, as far as steroids, dexamethasone is very potent to control this disease, but it has a lot of potential side effects. So for this opportunity, to have an even more potent drug with much less uh, opportunity for side effects is, is pretty cool. And we're pretty excited about this. It's new on the market and, and the number of horses that have been treated at this point uh, is relatively low, but we'll have some studies I'm sure coming out about the effectiveness of, of this medication. Um, that I think is all I have. Um, and I will be happy to take questions. 
Thank you, Dr. Holbrook. So You're does anybody welcome. have any questions? Again, you can uh, either raise your hand um, on this, you know, the icon or uh, type a question into our question and answer box. Lisa, um, oh, did you unmute her? Okay, Lisa, go ahead and ask uh, Dr. Holbrook your question. Hi, Dr. Holbrook. I have a 14 year old mare that I have owned her entire life and she has been in the same pasture her entire life. And when she was 11 that spring, she developed a very, I would say, severe um, case of hives. Okay. Uh, she gets, she gets, they, she is covered in them, but they don't seem to bother her. So she doesn't seem itchy or anything like that. Okay. Um, I had heard about the omega-3, so I put her on that. And that, that year, that seemed to work pretty good. Not, actually knocked it out in a few days, which surprised me it worked that fast. Um, I used that route because we were attempting to breed her, so I didn't want to do anything, you know, more drastic. Sure. Um, so the next year she was pregnant and then lactating in the spring and had no problems, what's nothing, had no symptoms whatsoever. In fact, I forgot that she had done it the year before. And, and she then was, her, was she still on the supplement at that point with the pregnancy? No, no. no. Okay. Uh -uh. I took her off. I, I kept her on the supplement through the summer and then took it off in the fall. Um, so she was not on the supplement. And, and like I said, she had nothing happen. And then this past year, I did it again um, when she was not pregnant or lactating. Um, put her back on the omega, same omega-3 supplement and um, it did not work as well. Um, and then I added MSM to it. And then at that point, it seemed to help her. Um, but again, it's, I would say it's, it's an extreme case of hives. I mean, she gets them everywhere. Um, and then they, then they grow into the bigger wheels. Um, but she, um, it doesn't seem to bother her any when we don't show her. So I guess. And how, really like how frequent does she have them? She just started doing this in the spring. So this would be, this past spring was the second year that she did it. And then, but it, like on a weekly basis or whatnot, when you go see her every day and feed her, she's got some. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When, once it starts until I put her on the supplement, she keeps them. And it's, it's, a, it's amazing. She's t every, I mean, it's on her head. It's on her, it's everywhere. And then um, come winter, what happens after the first frost when there's still grass and whatnot around here? Well, I, I, both times when I put her on the supplement, I kept her on the supplement through the summer, um, usually quit it in the fall and then she's fine. She never so, has gotten them again, you know, beyond, beyond the spring. Um, okay. once, once the supplement kicked in, that was fine. So I guess what I'm wondering, I'm assuming she's going to do this every year now. Um, and can I, should I start that supplement? before i see the symptoms if, if you can yeah if you can afford okay. it that would be optimal <clears throat> i guess you know given the seasonality of it it could be something in the pasture as far as the pollen um, but it could also be insect hypersensitivity even though she's not itching um you know or it could be a it could be a food-based allergy and something in the pasture yeah i kind of assumed it was something in the pasture just because mm -hmm. of because of how it uh, appeared um but so i could just go ahead and start early and and see if that i probably would you know you could try something like antihistamines on her there they have I, I would they are much safer okay instead of instead of reaching for a steroid uh, yeah because they don't seem to cause her any problem you could compare the cost of treating with an antihistamine versus the cost of your omega-3s um, and it may be, you know, if the antihistamine works, it may be cheaper. I actually use one of the, I guess, the lower, the lower cost omega threes. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not too bad. And I had another horse that had an insect allergy one time and I, we tried the antihistamines on him and he had a really severe reaction to that. So mm -hmm. I was always kind of afraid of the antihistamine thing. Yeah. Depending on the, depending on the antihistamine, some are safer than others, but they're, they're all generally safer than steroids for sure. But, um, well, I wouldn't mind. I don't know if you're, 
um, have access to our email here, but I, um, some pictures of really severe wheels on her. Not that I'm wishing she does that again, but uh, <laughs> if they're really severe, I wouldn't mind having a picture of that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I will. If, if it happens again, I will. Because it's it's truly amazing. It's um, yeah. I honestly have not seen, I've seen hives and horses before and I've never seen them like this. Yeah, but it, some horses, but it, and I didn't, I didn't present any of this information. It's a lot less common, but some horses have swelling of their um, salivary gland. Oh, wow. In their own pasture, and, and it's probably an allergic reaction as well. Now, um, I had a horse one time, actually, it's her full brother, that his cheeks, like, puffed up one spring. Yeah, and that's probably salivary gland. Yeah, that he just did it that one time, and who knows. So, uh, just any... With the pregnancy um, lactating thing, is that? Yeah, that's interesting you mentioned that. So there are definitely hormonal impacts on, on our immune system. And um, there, there are even some types of cancer, skin cancer in horses that are uh, influenced by hormones and, and can, can change with pregnancy. Um, so that, that doesn't surprise me. Okay. Um, so you could breed her every year. Yeah, that's okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so we have another um, allergy question um, kind of relative to feeding supplements. So um, last summer was the first summer with their horse that were allergic to fly bites um, at the age of 13 um, and had hives. They put them on uh, a supplement, a platinum skin and allergy, helped a little bit, started the horse on flaxseed oil in August, and they're wondering if they need to start the other skin and allergy supplement uh now or wait and see how he does oh uh, so the depending on how much flaxseed you're feeding I, I it's hard to answer that question without looking at the two supplements um and specifically making sure there's not too much flaxseed um but the flaxseed will provide some as well um but in general the earlier you start that again it takes three to well, it, at least two months for it to start reaching maximal effectiveness. So I would want to start at least that many months before fly season or whatever they're allergic to season. Does that make sense? I think so. Hopefully. <laughs> so Ed, uh, I have a, a question you had in your, uh, in your talk that horses may develop psychogenic related Oh, of great. wheels yes so is that a a nervous horse or what is what is going on with a psychogenic wheel that that is uh close to a diagnosis of idiopathic but it has been confirmed uh, by ruling out a lot of other things we see the most common psychogenic uh hmm, problem i would say that i that i see as an internist is actually overconsumption of water um, so horses will develop, you know, stable vices like weaving, like, um, you know, pacing, uh, cribbing, excessive water drinking is thought to be along the same thing as far as psychogenic, but psychogenic wheels, that is a very rare diagnosis. Um, it, I never have confirmed that. The exercise associated wheels is, is more common and is definitely definitely been diagnosed and confirmed and that that may have something to do with who knows you know uh heat production changes in acid base changes in electrolytes at the level of the skin who knows but some horses will develop them associated with exercise the psychogenic i've never seen before so no first-hand experience on that no, one ma'am Hey, does anyone have any other questions for Dr. Holbrook uh, with either respiratory or um, skin allergies in horses? 